thank you all for coming. I, I realize it's Sunday and that's kind of a family day and a day off, so I really appreciate you all being here. And hopefully at the end of my talk, you'll have lots of questions and we'll have a great discussion. So anyway, um, this is the title of my talk, The Role of Cognitive and Emotional Factors in Children's Early Math Learning. Um, so I'd like to start by just considering, you know, why we need to even think about early math. You know, when I was a kid, I think people didn't think about it much, and we waited till, you know, we were in elementary school, uh, your primary one grade, and, and then we started to learn. But um, more recently, we've learned that uh, the skills that, the math skills that children take to school, when they enter, have um, long-term predictive power of their uh, long-term trajectories. So if you enter school behind, it's likely that you stay behind. It, it's very hard to close gaps once they open. And so um, because kids enter school with very different levels of math skill, math knowledge, uh, we need to focus on those early years. Um, and then, you know, math, I think, I think of math as a social equity uh, issue. Um, you know, if you don't have those skills um, and you enter behind, you may never catch up. And then more and more jobs these days do require excellent quantitative thinking. And if you don't get to the, the levels that you need to be at, you may not, you know, have those job opportunities. Uh, the other point of it is it's not just about the individuals who are behind. I think that it's a societal issue. Uh, by not being inclusive and not making sure that all children receive the kinds of uh, support and instruction they need during the early years, we uh, have a lack of diversity in the work workforce, and I think that we all lose because of that, because we know when we have diverse voices and points of view uh, in our workplace that, that we benefit from, from listening to uh, what people bring to the table. So. Um, <sighs> To give you a preview of what I'm going to cover in the part one of the talk, uh, we're going to uh, take a trip to figure out, you know, how parents do support early math in, in, the, in the home environment, what matters for early math learning, and also ask whether we can support parents so that they can improve and um, both quantitative and qualitatively the math supports that they offer to their children. Um, and then in part two, we're going to look at the emotional factors that uh, can affect math learning. So uh, I heard during my week here that, you know, Hong Kong is a very high pressure society for uh, everyone out here and uh, their children. And uh, in America, uh, th there is also pressure for kids to achieve, but maybe not to the extent that you experience here. So some kids who have good math skills by first grade are experiencing math, what we call math anxiety, and that's a global problem. Uh, and uh, another issue that we've come across in our research is that there are intergenerational effects of math anxiety. So when teachers and parents are math anxious, uh, it's often the case that children, their children that, or the children that they're teaching learn less math and also eventually develop math anxiety themselves, which can interfere with their interest in math as well as their math learning, and it's kind of a vicious cycle that we need to break. Um, but again, uh, fortunately, uh, we've identified some ways to intervene to support the math uh, 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 that, that parents offer their children when they're math anxious, when the parents are math anxious. So let's start with uh, a principle that, that Lisa mentioned, the cardinal principle. And the cardinal principle is really making the connection between the count list, you know, being able to say, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, which many or most really two-year-olds can do. Maybe they do it even earlier here. Uh, in America, they can do it by two. And the number of objects in a set or entities that the number represents. And you know, a lot of parents in America will say, you know, my child can count to 10, and they're so proud of them. But then they're really shocked when they bring them into the lab and they see uh, what I'm gonna show you in a minute. So, um, you know, there's a theory that uh, developmental scientists have identified that kids, young kids starting at around age two, 
go through a series of kind of stages where first they understand the meaning of one. Uh, if you ask them for one object, they'll give you one, and then a little bit later, they you know, can give you two and understand the meaning of that word. And after they learn three or four number words, their meanings, not just reciting the count list, they, come what we, they become what we call cardinal principle knowers. They understand that every number in their count list, as you get one deeper into the count list, represents one more in the set size. Um, so take a look at this little girl. I think this video will explain how we test this. Um, she's a two-knower. Could you put two fish in the bucket? I mean, a pond? Could you put three fish in the pond? very typical and uh, you know you could try it out on your own kids if they're the right age. Uh, parents are shocked because they think that if they can just say the count list they understand the meaning of the words. This is a really foundational mathematical principle and you have to understand the meanings of the number words in order to do much math, right? I mean you can't begin to add or subtract let alone multiply and divide if you don't even know what those words mean. Um, and research has shown that of course, everyone learns this eventually, but um, the age at which you learn this principle has that long-term predictive power. And we can talk a little bit later about why you know, kids who come in behind tend to stay behind. Um, I'll give you some of my insights, and I'd love to hear what you think, too. But one of the things that we found out about these, this cardinal principle is that you know, when you look at when kids uh, understand these words. This happens to be a four-year-old from middle and low-income backgrounds. You can see that almost all the kids from middle-income backgrounds understand the meaning of one, uh, but many fewer from the low-income backgrounds. And the same is true for all the number words up here. And, and this is a typical finding. Um, but interestingly, this socioeconomic gap isn't present for all early math measures. So with my colleagues, uh, Jane Ellen Huttenlocker and Nancy Jordan, we did a series of studies looking at um, what kids understand about early calculations when you give the calculation problems in the typical way as verbal problems, like how much is two plus one? Or um, Johnny has two pennies and his mom gives him one more. How many does he have all together? versus in a nonverbal format where we take two pennies and we say, watch this, no number words are mentioned, and we put them under a box, and then we slide one more in and say, now watch this. And then the child has a pile of pennies and we ask them, make yours like mine. So they have to do the calculation in their head. They don't have to know the number words, but they have to think about you know, the addition of those set sizes. And you can give that in a subtraction format too, where you put three pennies in, slide one out, you know, how many are in, you know, make yours like mine. You don't say the number words. And there you can see that on this kind of nonverbal task, there is no socioeconomic gap. So that led us to the insight that, you know, this socioeconomic disparity or gap is very related to let the language of mathematics. So um, that led us to look at variations in the math talk that children hear at young, young ages. So um, I was very fortunate to be a part of a long, longitudinal language project that actually began 14 years ago. And the original investigators on that project were Susan Golden Meadow, who is my colleague, Jane Elflin Huttenlocker, who was my colleague and passed away a few years ago, myself uh, and uh, Stephen Small, and then uh, we've since added Lindsay Richland and Steve Rowdenbush. So um, back in the day, 14 years ago, it seems not that long ago actually, we recruited a diverse sample of 14-month-old children who represented the diversity of the Chicago area. And um, we observed these uh, families in their homes every four months and we'd go in uh, with a video camera and for the first 90 minutes we would just ask the families to do what they normally do. We wouldn't say anything about you know, engaging in 
any kind of mathematical or language activity or anything. Just do what you normally do was the instruction. And then for the last 30 minutes we were there, we would have some time to collect some measures on the children. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, our code. We, we've coded these data in many ways. Uh, but before we did the coding, we transcribed everything that every child and parent said during our visit, as well as all the gestures that they produced. Um, I'm going to focus here on the first five observations from 14 to 30 months, so 450 minutes approximately of video time for each child, and also on a test of cardinal number knowledge that we gave the children when they were somewhat older at 46 months of age. So I'm going to play you a video of um, the kind of thing we saw because, um, oops, I hope it plays. Yes, it will. Uh, I want you to notice something about this video. It's not like giving these little kids, this is a two and a half year old, a worksheet or any kind of drilling. These number interactions that we saw, at least in the United States, are very playful. And they happen in the course of the day in a very playful and engaging manner. And I think that that's very important to keep in mind. <laughs> So you get the picture, and, and actually, this was a very um, rich number interaction. It might have just looked, looked like a simple, fun song, but the mom, you know, labeled the set size. She counted the fingers. She involved fingers, which turns out to be a representation that, that children understand very early. They uh, understand what this means before they understand what the word two means. And actually, when, when you, uh, you know, ask a child, how old are you, and they do this, you know, that, that, and they might not understand the word two yet, it's actually a signal that they're ready to learn the word. So um, those are things that, that parents and families can uh, look out for. But anyway, after we coded all this number talk, uh, we came up with something that's kind of disturbing, that there's a huge input gap. So, you know, that is related to socioeconomic status. Um, so we extrapolated, you know, based on our 450 minutes to a year's time, you know, estimating that kids are probably awake and alert eight hours approximately a day. And at the low end, a child might hear 1,500 instances of number words in a year's time. And at the high end, almost 100,000. So, um, yeah, it's, it's this gap, yeah, like I said, is related to socioeconomic status. And often, you know, when a child arrives at school, say in your K-1, you know, they might know a lot about number and understand a lot of mathematical ideas. And maybe the teacher and even the parent looks at them and thinks that they're, you know, they have some special math talent. But actually, they might have had many, many more opportunities to learn the number words. And maybe the child who only heard 1,500 number words is even more uh, talented than that child. So, uh, you know, the teacher doesn't know uh, about what those input differences are. Um, and, but, but what we know is that the input, the number, the cumulative number of number words the child hears during that period from one to two and a half years of age predicts their score on, you know, a task that's very similar to the given number task that you saw in the video. So it matters, these, these, these differences in um, the quantity of number words matter, but the quality also matters. So what, one thing that we found from our coding is that when number talk refers to present objects, like in that video, the, the present objects could be considered the fingers, um, that it's more predictive of the understanding than just rote counting. And another thing, this counting and labeling the set size going together is a, a very big predictor. But interestingly, uh, in, at least in the early years, parents tend to either count one, two, three, or to label set size, you have three pennies. And they relatively rarely put those things together. Yet from an experiment a colleague and former student of mine did, Kelly Mix, we know that those things coming together is what propels uh, mathematical thinking more. 
So uh, take a look at these videos, which kind of uh, give you a contrast between different kinds of inputs that are more and less helpful. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. And this last one. One, yeah, two. It was a lot of fun, but I don't know if the child could figure out what three means from that interaction. And then contrast it with this one where a father is looking at a photo album with his son, a family photo album, something we don't think. I, it's kind of sad. We don't do that too much anymore, except maybe on our iPhones, which is kind of different. <laughs> This is fourth birthday, so there's four candles, see? One, two, three, four. What color? So at least that child would have a chance to learn what four means. I'm not saying that one instance would do it, because these are hard concepts for little kids. Much harder than, say, learning the word for bottle. You know, when you point to an object, it's still not trivial to learn that word. But when you have to map a word to a set size, like four, that's much more abstract. Because when I count one, two, three, four, four doesn't mean the fourth thing I'm pointing to. It means the entire set. So that's why, you know, these concepts are hard for little kids. They're easy for us, but not when you're young. And, you know, it, it takes a, quite a bit of input to understand it. Um, the same, we found a similar story for spatial uh, language. And, um, you know, we found that parents who use more spatial language had children who are better spatial thinkers. And recently there's been a lot of studies showing that uh, good spatial thinking is uh, predictive of later math achievement as well as achievement in the STEM disciplines more broadly. Even when you control for you know, the numerical aspects of math and language skills. So um, kids who heard more spatial language from their parents were better at, at doing this task where you have to visualize two shapes coming together, what would they make? And these are pictures, so it's, you can't move the puzzle pieces around. You have to think about it in your head. Um, and I'm gonna just show you an example of a mom who's using a lot of spatial language with her son. Uh, he also is 30 months of age. Mom, this is who helps. Let me get the door. You have the door for house? Yeah. Where does it go? Right here. Uh, mm, no, see this is a straight edge, Joe? Yeah. If it has a straight edge, it goes up at the top. It goes up the top? Mm -hmm. It goes up the top. It does, but you have it upside down. I have it upside down. Um, mm -hmm. If you look at it, the straight part what? goes with the other straight parts. That's it. Oh. Okay, push. Oh, and I need one more straight edge. Where's right here. Does that have a straight side on it? Yeah. Where? Right here. No. Mm -hmm. you, need, you need one that has a straight edge, like this. A flat edge. Oh. That's not it. Put that one down and look for a different one with a straight edge. Okay. You almost touched it. That's the one. Yeah. Goes right does it go right here? It sure does, yeah. And look, you did the whole outside of the puzzle. I did. Yeah, now we need to. So, doesn't look like a great spatial thinker at this point in time, and the puzzle probably was a little too hard for him. But with his mother's scaffolding, with the, the language and the gesture, he gets a great sense of success. And um, he, he, you know, this is just anecdotal, but he does turn out to be a, a very good spatial thinker. But in general, the kids will hear more spatial language. Uh, it, they also engage more in spatial activities like block building and puzzle play, so they tend to go hand in hand. They do turn out to be better spatial thinkers. So why is that the case? Um, why do these spatial words help? Well, when you're um, carrying out these kind of mental transformations, you know, the one I showed you is easy, but if it was in three dimensions, you might be challenged. If you have some words to describe the objects, it gives you another way to hold on to the information and it re could reduce the cognitive lo load of, thing, you know, of doing a rotation like you might have to do when you study chemistry to figure out you know, whether two molecules are stereoisomers. Also, just habitually, you know, when you walk around the world and you see all kinds of spatial relationships, <laughs> having a rich spatial vocabulary might call your attention to those spatial relationships and that in turn can make you a better spatial thinker. 
But you know, so far what I've talked to you about, it's all correlational. You know, kids who hear more language of certain kinds know more. It could be, and you could argue, that the kids who hear more of this language are more interested in these things, and their parents are just responding to uh, you know their interests. Um, or maybe you know it's it's a genetic kind of a thing that the parents who are better mathematically have kids who are better <coughs> mathematically, and it has nothing to do with what's being said. So in, in the next step um, of our research, we decided to test whether we could figure out if there's a causal relationship between parent number input, going back to number now, and children's number knowledge. So we experimentally manipulated the math talk that parents provide. And we had to come up with a way of doing that. Uh, you know, we could have brought kids into the lab and just, you know, had an enriched math talk session or a few sessions and, and a control condition. but. You know, we, we thought that wouldn't work based on a few studies that have been published in the literature and also on the amount of input it would take. It would be a, a big lift for us. Also, we wanted a more ecologically valid method because, uh, you know, bringing them into the lab isn't something that would be sustainable. So we came up with the idea of uh, giving parents number books. And we did this with 100 kids and we randomly assigned the uh, parent-child dyads to one of three different conditions, uh, which I'll describe in a minute. But one of them is a small number book condition, a slightly larger number condition, book condition that went up to six, the small one only went up to three, and then control adjective books. That, and I'll show you an example. So this is a page from the large number book condition. Look at the rabbits. There are five. What do the five rabbits eat? The five rabbits eat the five carrots. And then I think this is kind of a critical component of the book. It's, it's active, it's active learning. The kids ask, can you count the five rabbits? Can you count the five carrots? And, and then here you just see a contrasting page from the lower number book on the top where it's two that's focused on. And then the control books are very similar looking. Look at the monkey, it is silly. What is the silly monkey? And uh, parents in each of the three conditions were given two different books in their condition. So if you were in the control condition, you would have two books with adjectives, not number words. And uh, in the number book condition, you have either two small number books or two slightly larger number books. So our first question, oh, the parents had these books for a month. And they were encouraged to read them several times a week, as many days as they could. But we also said, you know, Parents are busy, we know you might not get to it every day. And at the back of each of the books, there was a page pasted in where they could write when they read the book. And maybe they weren't perfectly accurate, but I think they were you know, pretty reliable. Um, and so we wanted to know this question. And what we found was pretty astounding. You know about the knower level theory now. Um, what we found is that the average knower level gain in a month was you know about a little more than half of an hour level in the number of condition, but you know the adjective condition, which we consider sort of business as usual. I mean the kids hear some number talk; they're also getting a month older, so they go up a little bit, but not nearly as much as if they got the number books because we're upping the number talk that children hear. Uh, and since kids were randomly assigned into the conditions, we assume that it's not just about you know, how mathematically talented you are, how mathematically talented your parents are, that the input does matter. Um, the, the second thing we looked at is whether it mattered which number book you got depending on where you started. And what I think is really interesting here is that the kids who were only knew the meanings of one or one and two, so the one and two knowers, benefited more from the books that are about one, two, and three than from the books that went up to six. Once you got to know three or four number words, it really didn't matter. It, although there's a little bit of a difference, it's not significant in favor of the larger number books. I think they could benefit from any number input at that point, because I think that they're working on something different. They're not working on mapping each number word one at a time, but working on that whole system. So even input about the number words they know, I think, helps them. And then kids who didn't even know one number word when the study started, they couldn't even give one. They really didn't benefit from the intervention, but they could have been months away from the mapping. And it, at least it's not hurting them, you know? 
they're, they're, they're pretty much the same as control kits. So do no harm is something we try. Um, and then I want to share with you one other number book uh, study that we've been doing. It has a kind of similar design, but we were wondering whether certain kinds of number books are better than <coughs> other kinds. Um, researchers tend to use these very clean displays, you know, where if it's not busy, kids have to just count stuff. But when you go to a store to buy a number book, they tend to be, you know, much busier. Uh, and we were wondering, you know, whether that mattered. Um, so we, we tested uh, 65 three-year-olds and their parents, again, you know, giving them the number books that we designed, and I'll show you those in a minute, for a four-week intervention. This time we brought them back after two weeks and at the end for assessments, uh, and there were three conditions and the log and all that. <coughs> so the three conditions here were the sparse number book, you know, that looks sort of like the researcher materials, a rich number book, uh, where not only are the pictures richer, but there's a storyline, and uh, other than just counting and practicing, and then there's a color control condition. So this is an example of a page from the sparse number book. Look at the cupcakes. There are two. Can you count the two cupcakes? And, and et cetera, et cetera. And it, it actually went up to 10. Um, and then in the rich number book, there's a character. In this one, it's Lucy. Lucy wants to go to the park to see her friends. They're asking her to bring 10 things to play with. So Lucy decides to look around her house for something fun to bring. Let's see if we can help her find enough to share. So, um, you know, the last page of this rich number book, you know, she goes through, you know, well, she finds one drum, it's not enough, two flowers, not enough, and finally she finds 10 kites. Finally, Lucy found enough to share with her friends. She takes the 10 kites to the park. Now everyone has kites to fly. Can you count the 10 friends? Can you count the, the 10 kites? In order to control things in the rich and sparse, we also had the picture of the kids with the 10 kites at the end of the, the sparse number book, but there was no storyline that supported it. Um, and then in the color control condition, it's all about the color of the cupcake, not the number of the cupcakes. So um, I don't know what you thought would happen, but uh, you know, a lot of researchers actually think that the sparse uh, stimuli would be better, but we were very, uh, not really surprised, but interested in the finding that the rich books led to almost a whole lower level gain over the month, which is much faster than the progression that it would take. I forgot to mention earlier, but usually to go through this sequence of learning these number words one by one and then generalizing so you understand you know, making an induction so you understand the meaning of all the number words in your count list takes 18 to 24 months. So we're really accelerating it through this number book intervention. In the sparse condition, there's some gain compared to the control condition, about a half of a, a lower level. And then also we found that the proportion of kids who gain in each condition really differs. So in the rich, it was 70%, only about 40% in the sparse, and very few in the control. Um, so it seems to me from these results that um, we can um, conclude that meaningful number books spark children's number learning. It's not just about practicing these skills. It's about connecting them to things that are meaningful to children. Uh, and it could be that an active ingredient in what made the rich books work uh, is that the, there was a number goal, it's not just any goal, and also that it was a social goal that it was sharing with friends. So we have a lot to unpack, you know, in terms of research questions, but I think that we've learned a lot from this study. Um, and it really does suggest to me that the number support that we give children should be meaningful. They should be able to understand why counting uh, is important in their lives. Um, you know, we've often heard people say, I don't understand why I have to learn this now. I don't need it, you know? So we have to help kids understand why they need it. And at their level, they needed to do things like having enough treats for their friends. Okay, another question that um, I started to think about, because most of the research that we've done is, you know, starting at two and a half or three years of age, is when should we start? And recently I've had the joy of welcoming two grandchildren into my life, my life, Rafi and Gabe. So this is a picture of Rafi at one week and Gabe at eight weeks. They're seven weeks apart. 
our family always does things crazy like this, you know, lots of lots of kids at the same time. Uh, and here, are, here's Rafi at four months and Gabe at five and a half months. And this is my grandniece, June. She's 20 months old, and you might notice that she's already reading a number book and sitting there on her own reading it. Um, okay, well, when these guys were really little, my husband, who knows that I study, you know, early math, said, aren't you going to count with them? And I said, no, that's ridiculous. You know, I'm holding this two-week-old kid, and the last thing I wanted to do was count. Um, but I have to say that right around this age, you know, I am reading books to them. They're looking at the books. And there's always things to count in books. They don't have to be um, about number. Like one of the books that my daughter-in-law really loves is called The Peace Book. And there's a picture of this sort of caterpillar wearing a lots of different shoes. Uh, and so I count the shoes, and he's watching me point to these things and count. I don't know what he's learning, but you know, I think part of it at around maybe six months of age is sort of getting the parents used to doing these activities. But you know, it's not going to be long before they're June's age, and she does understand the num some of the number words already. So um, I wouldn't suggest that you start, you know, the minute they're born, but you know, wait a few months and then get started. Okay. Well, now we're going to transition to part two of the talk, the emotional side of math. My husband likes this part better. So if you didn't like the first part, you, you probably are going to be interested in this. Part. Okay. So what is math anxiety? Math anxiety is a fear and apprehension a person feels around doing math. And it's experienced by people all over the world. Um, it's extremely common and it's negatively associated with math achievement. It's also sadly higher in females than males, at least by about fifth grade. So, you know, there's um, a lot of negative stereotypes about math. Math gets a negative rap, at least in America. So. Um, you know, it, it, it's very common for people to go around and say, okay, I'm, I, you know, I'm not a math person. And that's fine. It's almost like a club that you can belong to. Like, <laughs> not a math person club. Uh, but, you know, there, there isn't like a not a reading person club. You know, that would be embarrassing. But not a math person is okay. And um, I'd be interested in hearing from you whether that exists in, in Hong Kong as well. I know that, you know, math and science are highly valued here. There's also a lot of gender-related stereotypes about math, which are unfortunate. And I know that people are working on not having, you know, the Barbie doll now say math is hard or I'm too pretty to do math because that's very discour discouraging for females. So we know we need to change that. Um, and uh, the other thing about math anxiety that's unfortunate is it leads to this math avoidance. So people who are math anxious don't. You know, if there's an optional math course to take when you're in high school, you might opt not to take it, or in college. You know, for a certain amount of time, you have to take the math. But as soon as you can opt out, you opt out. You might not even be the one at the, at the table to calculate the tip. Or if you go on a trip with your friends, you're not the one that figures out, you know, how to make the money all balance. You, you just don't do those things. And so by not doing those things, you get worse and worse at math because you're not practicing. And we know that you know, time on task matters in terms of learning. So I'm just going to show you a video here. Uh, I don't know, do you guys know who Larry David is? He's a comedian, and, and you know, at least we see him a lot in America, but listen to this scenario. Thanks again, guys. Okay, thank you. You're right. Uh, it was, it was, uh, it was pretty hard. Yeah, good job. Thanks. Um, it's because you didn't leave a tip, and usually when I provide an excellent service, uh, my customers like to tip me. Well, there is an 18% tip included. Generally, I do leave an additional tip, but you know what? I'm kind of protesting the additional tip. I don't I don't care for it. You're protesting? You know, yes. Let them charge me 20%. Let them charge me 25%. I'd rather be charged a 30% tip included mm -hmm. than have to add up 18% to 20% to 25%, whatever. That's not that much, man. It's, it's 2%. It's, it's, it's hard to get to 2%. I think 1%, you just move the decimal place two spots. Uh, and then okay, you, you have a system. I don't have a system to get to Two percent. You know, don't make me do math at the table. So you're protesting math. I'm protesting math. Exactly. So he's protesting math. You know, uh, I think a lot of people protest math, and this is.
kind of funny, but on the other hand, it's, it's pretty sad, too, that we, we were laughing at these things. We wouldn't laugh at people who couldn't read. We think it was sad. So I'm wondering, why don't we think this is sad? But in any case, this math anxiety exists all over the globe. And uh, uh, about, I think, two years ago, we uh, formed a collaboration to analyze the relationship between math anxiety and math achievement around the globe using the PISA data, which is a test that's given to samples of 15-year-olds from all over the world. And I, in red, I have the United States. So oh, first, let me orient you to the x-axis here is the index of math anxiety. So the farther you go this way, the more anxious you know, the people on average in that country are. And then your, your mean math score is here. So in general, you know, the, um, I, I did this wrong. The, the math anxiety is, is, the higher your math anxiety, the lower your math achievement. Let's put it that way. Okay, so look at the United States. We're, we're kind of average in math anxiety. Um, and we're mm, a little less than average in math achievement. And look at Hong Kong. You're really good at math achievement. I mean, kind of a lot of the Asian countries are, right? They're, they're way up there. But they're much higher in math anxiety than you would predict given their level of math achievement. So, you know, if you, I don't know where Finland is, but Finland is sort of high in math achievement and low in math anxiety. So that's where we want to be. So, you know, Hong Kong doesn't have a problem with math achievement. They have a problem with math anxiety, a much bigger problem than you would think that they should have. So one of the questions that we've been asking is where does this math anxiety come from? Do young children experience math anxiety? And if they do, how does this relate to their math performance? So how do you test math anxiety in a young child? You can ask them questions like, not this isn't three-year-olds, this is more like first graders. How do you feel when you get called on by the, by the teacher to explain a math problem on the board? In, in the, you know, before they start we explain, you know, this person's really happy, a little bit happy, kind of, you know, neutral, a uh, little sad, and very sad or worried. Okay, so we ask them a series of questions about math. We also have some reading questions as a control. And we also assess their math achievement using a standardized test called the Woodcock-Johnson Applied Problems Test. So, you know, you can see a couple of examples of the kinds of problems that kids of this age might get. We also assess kids' working memory using a digit span test where they have to repeat series of numbers that, um, you know, first two numbers, and then it goes up and up and up until they can't do it anymore in a forward order, and then they're given different sets of numbers to repeat in a backward order. So the, the forward test sort of their memory, and the backward test more their executive functioning, because they not only have to remember the sequence, but manipulate it. Okay, so what we find is the same pattern we see in adults, and we see this pattern in adults in, in all the countries that you saw in the other graph too that first of all, kids with lower working memory do worse than kids with higher working memory. But for lower working memory kids, math anxiety, at least you get, even in adults, doesn't make as much of a difference. Where it really makes a difference is for the people who are doing well in math, who have high working memory capacities, or at least have the potential to do well. So you can see that the high working memory individuals with low math anxiety are doing much better on that applied problem test than the high working memory people who have high anxiety. And why is this? We did another study to try to get at it. What we found is that the low working memory kids, when they were given word problems, were doing things like, uh, this was eight plus four. They're counting on their fingers a lot, nine, 10, 11, 12. And it doesn't matter whether they're high or low math anxious, because those aren't taking up their working memory, those finger counting strategies. But for the high working memory kids, the highest red square there, who aren't math anxious, they're using more sophisticated strategies that we call decomposing. So maybe they don't know what eight plus four is. So they say, well, four plus Four equals two plus two, eight plus two is 10, and then I do 10 plus two and I get 12. So they decompose it. 
and they figure out what the answer is. But that takes working memory. And if you're worrying, like I'm going to flunk and I don't know how to answer the question and you know all this, then what happens with those kids is that they more commonly revert to the less sophisticated finger counting strategies, which are more error prone. So, working, uh, so math anxiety is a problem for young kids, at least by first grade, and it's a problem that is most deleterious to the math achievement of kids who at least potentially have high potential to achieve at high levels in math. And then the, the uh, last topic we're going to turn to here is intergenerational effects, whether teacher and parent math anxiety relates to children's math learning. Up until the point that we did these studies, at least to my knowledge, people focused on the math anxiety of individuals, either adults or children. But you know, we were the first to ask whether one person's math anxiety could have effects on another person's math learning and their emotions about math. So we asked about teachers' and parents' math anxiety and whether that predicted children's math learning and perhaps even their math anxiety. One problem in America, and I don't know if this exists here, it would be interesting to see, is that who are the most, most math anxious college uh, majors in America? Elementary school teachers. I'm not blaming these teachers. I think it's you know the, the fault of our education system. But you know you're, we're putting math anxious teachers in front of little kids to teach them math. And in fact, a lot of teachers of young children in America, preschool and elementary, tell me that they went into those fields because they didn't. They like kids. That's one reason. And they didn't like math. <laughs> but yet, they're teaching them math. So that's a big problem. Um, you know, before I show you how we measure math anxiety in little kids with the smiley faces, with adults, we can use you know, scales that are a little more sophisticated and ask them how they would feel if they were studying, how anxious would they feel if they were studying for a math test? Not at all. Little, fair amount, much, very much. Uh, you know, reading a cash register receipt after buying something. My husband doesn't even read cash register receipt. <laughs> anyway, uh, he just buys the stuff. Anyway, and then, then receiving a math text. You know, so, so there's a series of questions I answer, and this is a test that's been found to be reliable and valid. Okay, so uh, the first study that we did on this intergenerational transmission involved teachers, uh, first grade teachers, and um, what we found is that when teachers were math anxious, more math anxious, and, and I'm showing this as categories, but we really had, we had it as a continuous variable in our analyses. Um, we find that the, the students in classrooms with high math anxious teachers learn less math than the ones who are in the classrooms of children with low math anxious teachers, and that's particularly true of girls. Although in a large-scale replication study, we found that it's true of both boys and girls, although the effect is still a little bigger for girls. Um, another thing we tested in that study was stereotypes. So we told kids a story. Uh, there's a kid who really likes math. Can you draw a picture of that kid who really, really likes math? And then we tell a similar story about reading, and we counterbalance the order. And then they would draw pictures. And we often had to ask them whether their picture was a boy or a girl, uh, because that's what we cared about. But this shows, you know, this kid drew a girl with a book for the reading. And she said this was a boy for the math. And you could see she drew 2 plus 2 equals 4. So this kid embraces the common stereotype that boys are better at math than girls. Because they draw a boy for math and a girl for reading. So we scored these. Uh, drawings and we found that um, the kid, the girls who embrace this stereotype are the ones that are most affected by the teacher's math anxiety. And in fact, the teacher's math anxiety predicted the girls sort of catching the stereotype. The teachers are mainly females, so there are very few uh, male math teachers. The stereotype, as I said before, is in our culture, unfortunately. Um, so maybe, why, why is this the case? Teachers might display their own math anxiety while they're teaching. They might say, you know, 
math's not that important. I'm not even good at it. One of my kids' teachers said that chemistry teacher, female, said in high school, you know, don't worry if you're not good at chemistry. I'm not good at it either. That was <laughs> my <laughs> um, they, they might not teach lessons as effectively, and they might spend less time teaching math, you know, as part of that math avoidance thing I talked about before. How about parents? Is parent math anxiety related to children's math achievement, and how does it relate to their homework health? Homework is sort of a tense time around a lot of people's families. Um, so here we tested 465, sorry, first and second grade children at the beginning and the end of the school year on that same standardized measure. And we measured parents' math anxiety, math education, and the frequency with which they helped their sec first and second graders with their homework. So for the lower math anxious parents, and again, you know, we analyze this as a continuous variable, it didn't matter whether they reported helping their kids more or less with their homework. The kids still did well, uh, gaining about a, a school year of growth uh, over the school year. Um, but for the parents who were math anxious, their homework helped backfire. The more they help their kids with their homework, uh, the worse the kids did. So this is the more homework help bar. So think about what that could mean. These parents need help. <laughs> um, so the next thing we looked at is we backed up to earlier ages, and we asked whether the math-anxious parents talk less about number to the, their kids and whether the quality of their talk differs maybe their math avoiding. So we have, um, in this study, 36 parent-child diets, or again, from our longitudinal database. The reason we don't have as many as the first study is we didn't get the measure of the parent math anxiety on all the parents, and also we didn't have all five of the sessions that we wanted on the kids. But the parents varied a lot in their socioeconomic status, you know, just like they did in the the entire study, they were reflective. And what we found is that par the parents who are more math anxious talk less about number with their kids over those early data points. Um, but we, it wasn't for all kinds of number talk. They counted just as much. There was no difference anyway. But for the cardinal labeling of the set sizes, they really differed a lot. So I think all parents, if they think about number at all, they think about counting. Um, so in our next step, the last thing I'm going to share with you is whether we can do anything about this. So we had the opportunity to do a study using a math app called Bedtime Math. Some of you might know about it. It's freely available. You can download it. It delivers um, sort of a math scenario every day. It's not an app like you hand the kid the iPad or whatever. It's, it's an app that's designed for parents and children to do together. And the problems are fun and engaging. Um, and yes, like I said, one comes a day and there's questions for each of the scenarios at different levels. So this particular example is about whipped cream. And the kid learns that it was invented 500 years ago, credit, credited to a bunch of guys with long, unpronounceable Italian and French names. Um, and et cetera, et cetera. After you read the little paragraph, they get questions like this. If you can whip two cups of heavy cream into six cups of whipped cream, how many cups of air did you whip into it? And um, so, you know, the problems are about things that, you know, would make kids interested, like whipped cream. Most kids like it. Um, and uh, there's sports ones, and you can even search by topic that your kid is interested in. Uh, and then we created, uh, the researchers, a reading app a version of this that had similar paragraphs, but you know we stripped the number stuff out and the questions were more like reading comprehension questions. And we randomized the families to get either the math app or the reading app, and we named the thing Bedtime Learning Together. We didn't want to name it Bedtime Math. That wouldn't fit the reading group. <laughs> So we had you know, almost 600 first grade families participating. They were randomized. This just shows you know, what it could look like. And it does, parents knew they didn't have to do it at that time, but a lot of them did. <laughs> OK, so at the beginning of first grade, when they, you know, right before they got the um, 
the, the, yeah, the, the reading and the math group, the math groups in red, they didn't differ in their math knowledge, which you know we wouldn't expect them to because of the randomization. But by the spring of first grade, you can see that the gap is opening. And then a little bit more, and then it sustains. And, and this is for the higher math anxious parents. So when the higher math anxious parents got the app, the math app, they did better than the high math anxious parents who got the reading app. We didn't see an effect for the lower math anxious parents. You know, they're right on top of each other. That's the graph on the right. My guess is because those parents are already doing a good job supporting their kids' math, their homework helps good, and they have positive, more positive attitudes toward math. Um, another way to look at this is that the gap between the math achievement of the kids of math anxious parents and less math anxious parents opens up and gets bigger over time if they're in the reading condition. And um, if they're in the math condition, we get rid of that opening up. And it just, they do just as well as kids of parents who aren't math anxious. So um, recent findings show that these gains don't fade out. These effects don't, don't fade out. Uh, we, we see them in the spring of third grade when the app use has decreased to almost zero after the first year. You know, people like novelty, and they're not going to keep this up forever. Um, and we've also found that the sustained gains, you know, it's, we were a little mystified by, you know, how they're not using the app, but the kids still show an advantage a couple years after they got it. It's that we change the parents' attitudes. We haven't, about math, we haven't made them less math anxious. But for math anxious parents, if you look at the solid line here, the more math anxious that they are, the less they expect of their kids uh, in terms of math, and the less they value math for their kids. But when they got the math app, you can see that, that in the dotted line that we've mainly gotten rid of that association. At least we decreased it substantially. So now those math anxious parents who got a chance to talk to their kids about math through the app can see that their kids enjoy it, that they can do it, that it doesn't mean that because they're anxious about math that their kids can't do math. So um, there's a lot of literature in social psychology that shows when you change attitudes, when you increase expectations and value of something, then kids do better and you yourself can do better if you expect yourself to do better. The last question, and I'm almost done now, is about kids' math anxiety. Like, is that related to parent math anxiety? So um, we have parents with lower math anxiety, higher math anxiety in both conditions here. We don't see any difference when the kids are in first grade. But by the time they're at the end of third grade, in the reading app control condition, we see that the kids of the math anxious parents, the dark bar here, they're much more math anxious than the, than the kids of the low math anxious parents. But let's see what happens in the math condition by the spring of third grade. No difference. And they're both as low as the, um, the non-math anxious parents who got the reading app. So, We've, I think we've prevented, to a large extent anyway, through this intervention, the anxiety from developing. So the takeaways that I hope that you get from the talk are that parent math talk is related to, parent, uh, to children's math learning. Parent math anxiety negatively relates to parent math support in children's math learning, both in terms of quality and quantity. Um, but providing, and this is fortunate, that we could provide math anxious parents with effective ways to talk to their children about math. And this promotes children's long-term math learning. It increases parents' value and expectations of, of the math success of their children. And it prevents the development of children's math anxiety. So it's a simple message. Increasing adult child math talk and improving adult math attitudes leads to higher children's math achievement and more positive math attitudes. And hopefully if we do this, no one will have to call tech support for a problem like that. No one will ask, you know, put math on the <laughs> library. Um, 
And I want to thank you for your attention, thank my collaborators, my lab, and my funders. And you. Thank you. Um, I've been told by a friend, actually my friend's husband is very good with math. Like, he's originally from China, but right now they live in California. So um, it seems like their son have some issue learning math, considering, you know, how good the father's math is, you know, they just can't an understand why the son is such a, like, a mediocre in math. Mm -hmm. And they come up with these um, findings, which I'm not sure how true it is, is that um, kids whose native language is Chinese, they seem to have an easier time being good at excelling math. It may come down to linguistic relativity. Um, um, I, I don't know like at what certain age um, this difference will happen because I imagine if you just counting and labeling like Chinese and English should be the same. Right. The reason I ask is that in Hong Kong, I think a lot of the parents they need to consider whether they want to send their kids into a bilingual school where Chinese and English are given equal importance or whether it's like a very established pure international school, which like ESF or HKIS. Um, where they teach Chinese more like they teach maybe French or you know basically a mm -hmm. secondary language. Yeah. So that's why um, um, that's one of the uh, decisions we will have to make. Um, you know whether we want to choose a bilingual school or a truly international school. Yeah. And if native language as Chinese is so important for the kids to develop their math skill, um, maybe at least at a certain age perhaps we should put them to the bilingual school until that critical age arrives, and then later on considering sending her to like more international schools. So that's actually yeah. the question yeah. I have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a big question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know about the research, you know, and I do, you know, respect the um, Chinese number system. It's very transparent, you know, 10-1, 10-2, and all that. And um, I think it is helpful. There's certainly plenty of talented <laughs> English-speaking mathematicians who never learn Chinese. Uh, I don't think it's uh, you know a huge factor uh, in, in, in the equation. So I wouldn't make the school decision on that basis. You know, uh, the the friend. You know, kids vary in you know in their skills. And one thing we learn as parents is that our kids aren't our clones. I have four kids, and I certainly learned that. Uh, very quickly that they have their own interests and they're not going to be a little me, you know, so maybe the mathematician's son isn't going to be a mathematician. That's okay. There's lots of room in the world for all kinds of talents. Um, maybe he feels pressure, I don't know, you know, from the father being so successful. But I, I do think that, you know, sort of along those lines, that when we're thinking about little kids, it's important to fold the math talk into what the kids are interested in. If they're interested in sports, lots of opportunity to talk about math and sports. If they're interested in dinosaurs, you know, count the number of little triangle thingies coming out of the, you know, back of the, uh, is it a stegosaurus? I think so. Anyway, so yeah, follow their interests, you know, because the math is everywhere. You know, I could count the chairs in the room, the shapes of the doors. I could label them. I could talk about four sides and all that. So. You know, wherever you are, you can do it, but I think you're going to get a better response from young children if you fold it into what they're interested in, make it meaningful, do it during their daily activities or during play, like a game, board games are really good, puzzles and blocks and those kinds of things. Yes? And I actually want to know from you, uh, what is the Like what you mentioned, um, People believe that math is a fact, is a matter of how well you practice, like how much you keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned it, like you know, if you avoid it, then you practice less, and then you go behind, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when you're talking about the tactics of how to go about math, it's like breaking it down, making it more easy to understand. Right. So I want to know whether it is an and or is it an or. So. Because a lot of kids, like the people I know, parents I know, they send their children to Abigail's classes and so many math learning classes. And I know there's a point at which the job, like the water starts going yeah, right? Yeah, right. right. The learning starts going Everyone's stressed out. Yeah, yeah but, but I want to know, what's the right balance? Is it and, or is it really a great start where they learn and understand and engage with numbers and the practice and learning will follow as they grow older, or it should be like yeah, both together? 
I wouldn't pressure, you know, a little kid, uh, you know, when I'm, I'm talking about maybe up to five years of age or any time really, uh, to do math all the time or, you know, go to special schools for it. I'm, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but I, I, I certainly don't think it's necessary. A lot of it's about interest. You know, the president of the University of Chicago, uh, Bob Zimmer, is a mathematician. And one time we were talking about, you know, math and, you know, we had kids who went to the lab school together. And there are opportunities when you're a lab school student, you know, there's plenty of accelerated high school courses. Some kids even, you know, get through those courses and take classes at the university while they're in high school, you know, if they've gotten through all the courses. And he said, and he's a mathematician, that he doesn't believe that what makes you a mathematician is hurrying or accelerating so fast that you know you have to be taking university courses while you're a high school student. Now maybe there's a very few kids who need that, you know, but um, in general I think it's about sparking the interest, you know, asking the right question, get your kid to think mathematically. I don't even think it matters whether they get the right or wrong answer. It's about getting them to explore how they got to that answer and share it with you and think about it. There's a lot of good thinking when the answer's wrong, and sometimes the answer's right and the kid's just doing it by road and doesn't know what they're doing. So I hope that yeah. sort of answered. Yeah? Yeah? My question is, um, what opinion have you formed about preschool as a result of your research. Um, here in Hong Kong, a lot of us send our kids to school at the age of two. Um, and I know that that is, from my understanding, kind of a polar opposite of what they do, for instance, in Finland. And I was interested to see that Finland popped up in your yeah, uh, presentation, because yeah. it seems to be popping up everywhere. And um, if I'm not mistaken, they send their kids to school at like the age of six or seven or something like this and don't really do any kind of academic type learning before that. So I'm curious how you feel about um, sending your kids to school at a younger age and what kind of effect that has yeah. for them. You know, I think we have to think about cultural context. And I don't know about enough about what's going on. I'd like to learn more about Finland, but I, you know, in their cultural context, I know in Norway, you know, people get these huge parental leaves, you know, that they can stay home with their kids for a while, and that's not true in America. You're lucky if you get three months. There's a lot of families where both the parents are working, and there is no choice, really, you know. They, they have to send their kids to, to preschool, uh, and often well before, too. So, you know, I think it depends on the context, and I also think that, you know, Many things that work well in one cultural context won't work in another cultural context. So it's not like, you know, I, we saw a beautiful lesson taught at a preschool here. Uh, I think it was the um, Delia School, you know, and uh, they, they were just teaching a very logical lesson about sets of two and sets of five and the kids were really engaged and then you know when she had the kids put sets of two on a train and there were two on each train car she linked it to how you know when you wanted to figure out how many there were on the train you didn't have to count by ones you could you know do two four six eight ten and when there were sets of five the same thing and that was a beautiful lesson i don't think we would see lessons like that in preschool in america but you know, I don't know, just mapping the curriculum that's probably better here to the United States con uh, context might not work. There's a lot of other, you know, moving parts that we have to think about. So uh, I think, you know, it's okay to send two-year-olds to preschool. I think it should be a good preschool. I think kids can learn a lot of social skills in preschool, too. So, yeah, and they'll, they'll probably pick up some math there, too. <laughs> yes. I have a question about the kids' math anxiety, and if the one kid shows some math anxiety symptoms already, any effective ways we can bring it down? As the more we talk to uh, about math with the kid, actually it could be a vicious cycle that the kid will be more anxiety, despite I can push up a little bit on the math achievement. Mm -hmm. And my second question is, I look at your, uh, your one of your chart it is about your working memory, the effectiveness of working memory versus the anxiety. Actually, the working memory 
it looks like overweight uh, anxiety because yeah. the lung is always up. Right. So any okay. way to effectively increase the working memory part? Thank you. Yeah. I'll take the last part first, the working memory increase. You know, there's been a lot of, um, there's been a lot of uh, interventions developed to improve working memory. And my read of that literature is that they haven't been that successful. You know, you could, you could maybe find ways to work around it if you don't have as good a working memory, you know. Working memory does develop over time, though, so, uh, you know, if the kid has a low working memory, they're going to improve. Um, and there are, you know, we do have, we can write things down, we can use, you know, calculators and things like that. So, you know, I think we have ways to work around it. But um, in terms of if you have a kid who is showing signs of math anxiety, and you know a young kid, I think it's very important not to put even more pressure on the kid, but to um, if you're going to engage in math at home, to do it you know in a playful context, uh, like maybe some kids like to bake with you or cook with you. There's so many opportunities to do some math while you're doing that. So you're making a recipe for cookies, and you need you know, two cups of flour and one cup of sugar and two eggs and, you know, a certain number of teaspoons of whatever. What if you had more people and, and you wanted to double the recipe or have the recipe? You know, if the kid's interested in baking, it's a really non-threatening way to talk about math rather than always doing it over homework. And, and I think it could have some nice transfers to homework. And the baking context is just one idea. Yeah, so, so I think find the ways to make it playful. So, so many games have math in them. You know, play a game that the kid likes or do it during physical activities if they're very active, like, you know, how many times can you jump in a row? And uh, what if you jump 10 times? Let's time how long it takes. What, how long do you think it'll take you to jump 20 times? How about the, well, you don't want to do it too many times to exhaust the kid, but, Maybe they'll find out, like do a little experiment that you slow down after a while, you know? So it's not always the steady rate that they're getting tired. And you can, you know, make a graph of it. There's lots of ways to do math that could interest kids. Oh. Yes. Hi. Uh, hello, uh, Dr. Susan Levine. So glad to see you, first of all, here in Hong Kong. Yeah. She was so, in exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you uh, so much for flying over to Hong Kong. I was in a, a University of Chicago about 20 years ago. To be very honest, I wasn't that interested in kids stuff <laughs> at that point because I didn't have my own kids. But now, um, with the two little ones, I've been uh, paying more and more attention as parenting. Actually, my question is uh, to follow that gentleman's ones um, uh, about dealing with anxiety. So. Um, my girl, she got education in Beijing, mostly the Chinese way of counting numbers. I found that very helpful. For example, 11. Right. To ten say, one. yeah, 10 one, much easier to introduce later on the bigger numbers. Yeah. Well, my little one, she grew up here, I mean, in the English environment, but 11 is very difficult for him. So I've been trying to, you know, put less pressure, and I, did kind of feel somewhat anxiety there. For example, I tried to introduce the practice, eight plus seven. Mom stopped. He, he didn't want to even hear the kind of question. So my question was to you know, ask you for advice how to deal with uh, for parents to really reduce the anxiety, how to do. So I've been thinking, okay, I'll stop. But I'd like to get him to really kind of get rid of this kind of anxiety. And also, um, not so long ago, um, What's his name? Nobel Prize winner from Heckman. Chicago. Uh, Heckman, yeah. right. I was here. I was uh, very uh, honored and fortunate. I, I got a chance to discuss with him a little bit. And he emphasized about the different kinds of skills. By the end, the conclusion is confidence is very important. Yeah. So I was hoping to build his confidence, right? But I'm debating whether I should say, math is not difficult, right? You should be able to handle it. or I should tell him everything takes practice. You should try to practice more. But you know, that's the question in my mind. Should I emphasize, you know, it should be easy, try to build his confidence or try to encourage him. Everything is built upon practice. So let's practice more. 
So um, try to you know yeah. debate on that. And also the, speaking of earlier questions about cultural differences. So China emphasizes a lot on math, and one way to learn math, uh, maybe a little different from what um, you um, brought to us, like make it meaningful, like about numbers, we emphasize a lot of practice. Like we do hundreds of like nine plus seven, nine plus eight, like, <laughs> like later on multiplication. Young age. Yeah, without even understanding was nine nine multiple nine eighty one. Right? Oh, that's, that's making me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm always debating why, what should I emphasize, focus on to kind of uh, help him or uh, help myself or my husband release this kind of anxiety to feel, you know, I'm afraid of this man. I read a lot more, and I think yeah, I, right. I should have paid more attention to well, my kids. Like, Thank you. Know, you. You saw some of the videos, you know, that occurred during the preschool years, you know, that we found. And I think. Uh, a lot of them are pretty good, actually. What happens naturalistically can give us a clue to what to, you know, try to emphasize. Um, I think making it meaningful and not doing the drilling and the worksheets. I mean, in America, there's a lot of like, you know, no worksheet kind of thing. Now, you know, I think that it is more fun for kids to do things when, you know, in the context of a game or a, uh, even car, I don't know if card games are played, I think so, in this culture, yeah, card games, you know, they, they have a lot, they could have a lot of math in, it, in them, and, and it's fun. Um, and I also think it's important to keep in mind that you have to look for those moments with kids and, and, and look at the individual kid. I mean, maybe some kids love the drilling, and, and it's not going to hurt them. But other kids might really not like to with it, and the more you push it, the more they dislike it, and the more they get anxious about math, and then you need to pull away from that. One of the things that uh, we're working on now is a website for parents, and three of the messages that we have as our sort of key messages in the website is that, well, one is math is everywhere. You know, you can do it while you're waiting for the bus. You know, how long will it take the bus to come? Let's guess and see who's closer, and you know, you can do some math around that. Um, but you know, it's just, it's everywhere, it really is. Uh, the other is that math is social. Like a lot of people think of math as an isolated activity, like you're working on a problem alone, or you're doing a worksheet. But we can talk about math problems, just like we talk about social problems, or about whether we like a piece of art. You know, it can be collaborative. So it's not something he has to do alone. If you say, you know, what's eight plus seven? Let's figure it out together. What are some ways we could do it? Can you think of another way to do it? You know, it can be a discussion, and I think that's the way math classes should run too. You know, some kids might be able to share an idea. You know, there's many ways to solve the eight plus seven problem, and and they can talk about and share all their different methods. So you know, math is math is everywhere. Math is social. We could talk about it together. And then the third one, and I think this is really important, is math is a process. And it takes time. These are hard concepts, and you know they're going to develop over time. And you know, just because a kid doesn't know the answer at time one doesn't mean they're not going to know it at time two. Let's look for the strength in the wrong answers. Let's just engage kids in thinking and being interested and in liking it. I think that that's so important at the young ages because I think the way why kids move away from it is they, they're pressured. That's one of the reasons, and they don't like it. So um, I think we have to be really, really careful about you know, the lots of drilling. Now, maybe in a cultural context where everyone's doing drilling, it's more normal, and, it, and it, it's not the case that it's as uh, aversive. Um, but certainly, you know, when I think of the typical American kid, if they were given, you know, worksheets and lots and lots of practice, the meaningful, the meaningless stuff that you described, they might be valid. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Levine. You're welcome. Um, the way I think of mathematics um, is, is a way of uh, thinking that helps to solve problems. Mm -hmm. So, I wonder if through your research, have you seen, as children become uh, familiar with cardinal principles, have you seen their general problem-solving skills improving as well? And if so, uh, do you have any advice on how to integrate 
uh, general problem solving skills into mathematics. Yeah. Well, we, we are doing research now on what we call higher order thinking. Uh, you know, not just thinking about objects, but the relations between objects, you know. Um, you know, how, uh, like, say, uh, two animals are alike and different, you know, uh, like why do certain plants have certain shaped leaves and not other shaped leaves, you know, where do you think these plants live, you know, the ability to sort of bump up to that higher level thinking. And I think that math, mathematical thinking does support more generally this what we call higher order thinking that's so important for later school achievement because it's all about relationships understanding different kinds of relationships. The orders of numbers, the properties of numbers, how they work together, and, 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 that, and shapes, and, and all patterns, and all that sort of thing. So uh, yeah, um, I haven't thought about, I, I do know that when, we, when people do you know, math interventions, they, they sometimes have more general effects outside of math. So we actually found that um, in a math intervention that we did in, in preschool classrooms, it not only improved kids' math, but it improved their, um, their language comprehension skills. So uh, I think there is evidence of that. Um, I haven't actually thought about how we could take the mathematical thinking and use it to, it, you know, analogically to say it's just like this other kind of thinking, but I think that would be a really interesting research approach. Thank you. Yes? I'm asking this question as a, not as a parent, as a teacher. And what does your research show about um, explicitly teaching some math concepts versus discovering? I, I've, I've done, I've, I've done yeah. discovering math, and I see the children enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But then when you've got 30 children in the classroom, and there are some who are not getting it, I feel torn. Whether to mm -hmm. let them continue to discover and come up with the, you know, what they come up with, or explicitly teaching them. Sometimes there's not enough time at the end of the lesson, and you actually give them, you know, you, you just tell them how to yeah. do it. So I'm torn between what research shows over there. Yeah. I don't think we have a great answer. I think some kind of combination, you know, is going to work the best, and maybe different kids need different things. During the conference that we had here, one of my colleagues, you know, earlier this week, I guess last week, Guang Lei Hong presented some research about heterogeneous grouping of kids being very good for math learning. Uh, so you know, you could group kids, you know, the highest kids together, the lower kids together, uh, medium kids together. But what her research shows is that forming heterogeneous groups where kids have different levels of math is it turned out to be the most beneficial. So maybe that would help teachers partly solve the problem. Because when they share their ideas and they discover together, they might get different points of view and actually learn more. I think one of the most powerful ways of learning is to explain to someone else. So, you know, if you can articulate your idea to someone else and make it clear, then you really know it. And maybe that kind of articulation to the kid who might not discover on his or her own is going to be powerful for that kid. I totally realize that teachers face a huge, you know, sort of engineering dilemma in the classroom because they're not just working with one kid. The kids come in with a whole variety of different skills. So. You know, it, it, it's a tough problem, but that's one strategy. I have another question. Okay. Uh, what does your research show? What you mentioned about spatial? Yeah. And that when when my kids grew up, that's what we did: puzzles and jigsaws and yeah. spatial stuff. I see kids now, even in the classroom. If you have um, time, can we get on our iPads? And many times it's and they they they, they, yeah. they, they are going onto a math program. They will look at things. But there's this old school thinking, and especially seeing that, doesn't manipulating with your hands, doing things in the classroom versus doing it on an iPad. What, what does research show? We just did a study on that. I mean, it's not you know on everything having to do with that, but it has to do with like, you know that little task I showed where you have to imagine the pieces going together to see what it makes. This, this is a task that's probably good for four to seven year olds, that, that particular version of it. So, you know, kids vary in their ability to do that, just like they vary in everything. Um, 
but we had a training study where actually they were given, you know, first we did the pretest where they have to imagine and we knew how, you know, good they were at it. Then we had training where they either, you know, could move little puzzle pieces together and see what they made so they could touch them, see them, you know, and all they get the feeling of it. Or do it on an iPad where they, you know, could make the same hand movement, but now, you know, they're not real objects. Or they could just push a button and see them move together on the iPad or do a different kind of a finger movement to move them, but not the one you would use in the real world. Or gesture the movement where they have to imagine that they're moving their hands. And both the action and the gesture uh, training were much more effective in that spatial visualization than, than the iPad. So, you know, I think that the devices can be great. It's not like we're going to get rid of them. But we have to do research to understand, you know, how they can help kids and how, you know, what you're talking about, manipulatives, you know, that were, have been around for a long time. I mean, we, we evolved touching objects. We didn't evolve, you know, with these screens where we can move things around. Uh, are still better. So, you know, I think it's a great question. And I think that, you know, before we hand kids iPads and let them, you know, just learn on iPads, we better figure out, you know, whether it works or not and whether it works well. Thank you very Welcome. much. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Levine. Um, I have a question about um, this um, system called Kumon, hmm. which uh, I think a lot of people in Hong Kong utilize. Yeah. And what your opinion is on that? I think it's it's a global phenomenon. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't know that much about Kumon. I haven't studied it. Um, I, I hear great things about it. Um, I think that my colleague, the one I mentioned, Guan Lei Hong, has sent her kid to Kumon classes and you know bought the materials. Um, how? What? What age does it start at? I, I don't know the answer to that. I actually don't. I have four children, and I actually did not want any of them to do that, and they never did. Yeah. Okay. But then I was told after the fact um, that. Um, uh, so I don't, well actually other people here probably know what age it starts at, but it seemed like it was pretty young. Pretty young, I think, yeah. And, and then people said that um, if you do Kumon, oh, some of the teachers would say it's not bad as long as you do it after, say, you know, eight or nine years old. I see. Because you don't want to sort of solidify certain functions in the brain yeah. into yeah. like, pure rote memorization, it, okay. Yeah. But then on the other hand, if you go to schools here, you know, you find that since you're the only, if, if your child is the only one who's not doing Kumon, then your child actually is way behind in in the mental math. Because what it does is that I think it really teaches Solidifies mental. that. Yes, yeah, it's like rote yeah. and it's quick and, so, and then kids who do it, don't, they don't seem to be damaged materials when they grow up. Right. Right? It probably... I don't know. So yeah, it's curious. probably not, you know, one of those experiences that's like a make or break you, you know. Um, I can see where you feel pressure if everyone else is doing something. Um, you know, when I went to school, um, we did memor... I mean, do have Kumon, but, you know, there was a lot of drilling, and I did memorize all, you know, my multiplication tasks. Uh, I mean facts, and we were given these sheets of you know a hundred facts. We had to do them as fast as we can, and the teacher would say stop, and everyone's pencil would fly into the air. It was very you know anxiety provoking. When my kids went to lab school, they took a much more you know conceptual view. So you know they might have a problem like you know eight times seven, you know, and and my son who you know turned out to be really good at math, you know. He would say, well, I'm not sure, you know, 8 times 6 is 48, I remember that, and I have to, you know, add one more unit, and, and he kept to the 56, you know, so, yeah, I think it, 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 it drove, kind of drove me crazy, because there is a role for automatizing, you know, there, there, it certainly, you know, decreases the working memory load, and you can focus on what the problem's asking, but whether you need Kumon to do that, or just you know some years of experience. And again, I don't think it's necessarily the case that the kids who are ahead 
when they're eight years old are the ones who are going to stay ahead. And I think that, you know, we have to remember that kids develop along different trajectories. And, you know, what seems like it's an issue when the kid's in second grade, it, you're probably on to some other issue by the time they're in third or fourth grade. So, um, you know, uh, I just speak from a parent who also raised four kids and who sometimes got, you know, upset if the kid didn't know or do well on such and such, and it didn't determine their future. That's all I'm saying. That, you know, it's important to, like, just relax, not compare, look at for, for progress, you know, for your own child, and, and don't worry about what the other kids know or don't know at any particular age. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you, doctor. Um, actually, I, I'm also working with some labs for uh, robotics and STEM, and I do uh, cooperate with a lot of um, uh, training centers uh, across the world, like Australia, Canada, US, and uh, China. And we do find that for STEM courses, uh, we have more boys than girls, maybe 10 out of 10. Uh, we have eight boys and uh, only two girls, and that two girls may not so interested in STEM courses. So I just wanted to wonder whether we have any kind of statistics that maybe uh, boys are uh, better in STEM courses than girls in a certain age or like that. Great question. You know. Uh, with a grad student, I just wrote an article about this, so I'm a little bit up on it. You know, girls tend to do better in school and in all subjects, including math. Um, and at the conference we had here, um, we had somebody who works on uh, the TIMS project from Hong Kong, Professor Lung, and um, there was someone who reported that in the latest PISA findings, the girls did better than the boys in math. So the typical finding, though, is that boys do better on math tests, and girls do better in, in, in grades in, in math. Uh, so it's kind of interesting why we value the test scores more than the grades, because grades are more predictive of future achievement than test scores are. And one reason why, you know, at least in the past, that girls might score lower on these high stakes tests is because of those stereotypes and they're under stereotype threat. They feel like they're not good at math, so when they take the test, they're more nervous that their performance will reflect the stereotype. So, um, you know, there's also stereotypes that Asians are better at math. So, you know, if, like there's a, a sort of cool experiment where if before taking a test, you um, prime, this is with Asian girls, uh, you prime that their, their Asian identity by having them check off, you know, that. They do better on the test than if you have them fill in that they're a girl rather than a boy. So, you know, these, these thoughts that you have and these group identities that we have can affect performance. Now, why there's more boys in the robotics test? Yeah, I think it's a lot about society uh, and how we think, you know, about what boys and girls can and should do. In, in my longitudinal language project, I'm finding that. Um, at ages, you know, two and three years of age, uh, boys and girls are playing with blocks and shape sorters with their parents just as often. But once they hit three, most of the block play is going on with parents with boys. Most Lego sets are bought by parents for boys. Uh, you know, a lot of preschools have block corners. Who hangs out at the block corner? Mainly it's the boys. Now we know from the research that spatial thinking is very important for STEM achievement. We also know that um, block play improves spatial thinking. Now, so why don't we make sure that all kids you know, go to the block corner and get a chance to play with blocks? We don't let some kids opt out of reading, so why should we let girls opt out of block play? Um, I think it's very important for all kids to engage in, and I think girls could enjoy it too. So, um, you know, stereotypes, I think, play a role. Uh, maybe there's some, you know, uh, sex differences and in interests, but I don't think they're nearly as large as what you're describing with the, you know, eight boys for every two girls. Yes? Uh, 
Dr. Levin, thank you for very interesting insights. No, this is not really a question, but a, a story, a real story of uh, maybe six, 15, 16 years ago, this little girl was six years old. Um, one parent is Asian, one parent is African American and lives in California. At the age of six, she could not count to 100. She did not know her alphabets to uh, A to Z. And then she was very fortunate in being moved to the father's um, home in Southern California, entered into the best school among the 295 schools in the Costa Mesa district. Mm -hmm. At the end of the year, she could do addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, perfect. Yeah. And, she read, and she read almost 300 books and wrote 200 book reviews, little, little pieces. Yeah. So as I looked at her case, I, I thought that the bad anxiety of the teacher definitely was not there. She was very proficient. She almost won the top teacher of the year award. Um, and definitely the, the parent, uh, the, the step-parent uh, mother who tried to coach her, she, definitely she didn't have any math anxiety. And so I thought that perhaps that really is an empirical evidence right. to your research that that can happen. And even, even little persons who are less privileged can actually rise to the top. They um, can, because a lot of the differences that we see are differences that reflect opportunities to learn, not learning ability. And I think that that case that you shared with us, that wonderful story, shows that. Uh, all we know when a kid gets into school is what they can do. We don't know, you know, and what they, you know, know at that point, not what they can do, you know, given certain kinds of input. You know, the potential that kids have, uh, the untapped talent that we're missing in our society by you know, letting these um, socioeconomic differences exist the way they have for many, many years is, is terrible uh, because we're missing out on, you know, what a lot of people could contribute to society if they were given the chance. So um, this teacher was uh, very good at breaking down little math problems. So for instance, if it was a question of seven plus eight, so the, the kids, oh, it's too difficult. So, okay, eight, but let's look at eight. Eight is seven plus one. And so you have seven plus seven plus one, or maybe seven times two plus one. So yeah. she was very good at breaking down difficult things into small parts. And so I really admire this teacher. And I, I think to uh, echo, re reply Caroline, Caroline's question about Kumon, my son went through Kumon oh, okay. when he was in first, second, third grade. He thought it was really boring. But he's not damaged goods, no, <laughs> in terms yeah. of math. His math is a lot, a lot better than mine. So I, I think Kuman doesn't really do harm. Right. Thank you. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, uh, this discussion about, you know, the decisions we make for our kids, Kuman, not Kuman, you know, soccer, not soccer, you know, all these things that we think might be important, really, really important to their lives. You know, I, I once read something that we um, take too much credit when our kids are successful and blame ourselves too much when they're not. Uh, and that all we really are doing and can do is fine tune, you know, but they're individuals too. And, you know, we can give them opportunities, but they have to find their way. And it's not like so critical every decision we make. I think what's important is, you know, to love them and give them the chance, listen to them, find out you know, what their interests are and try to support them in their endeavors. And then you know, everything's gonna hopefully turn out okay. <laughs>